Okay, and welcome back to my last video on refuting Richard Carrier. Um, and this will deal with a common argument that many YouTube atheists will use, uh, channeling Carrier. But this argument isn't going to be used by any, any serious historian of the ancient world, and for a very good reason. It has to do with something called the Raglan scale. And Lord Reagan, Raglan was a um, person who studied a bunch of myths, essentially, and he tracked 22 features he thought were common to all myths. And I'll read you the scale, and then we'll look at a secular website that evaluates Jesus by it, and I will show you why this scale actually is just pretty much silly. Um, one, hero's mother is a royal virgin. Two, father is a king. And three, often a near relative of his mother. But four, the circumstances of his conception are unusual. And five, he is also reputed to be the son of a god. Six, at birth, an attempt is made, usually by his father or his maternal grandfather, to kill him. But seven, he is spirited away. And eight, reared by foster parents in a far country. Nine, we are told nothing of his childhood. But ten, on reaching manhood, he returns or goes to his future kingdom. Eleven, after a victory over the king and or a giant dragon or wild beast. Twelve, he marries a princess, often the daughter of his predecessor. And thirteen, becomes king. Fourteen, for a time he reigns uneventfully. And 15 prescribes laws, but 16 later he loses favor with the gods and or his subjects. And 17 is driven from his throne and city, after which 18 he meets with a mysterious death. 19 often atop of a hill. 20 his children, if any, do not succeed him. 21 his body is not buried, but nevertheless 22 he has one or more holy uh, sepultures. I don't know how to pronounce that word. Now let's look at how this... Uh, the website abuses the scale. Now for one, someone has already noted, the scale seems like it was designed to fit Jesus into these uh, myths, but let's assume it wasn't, and let's assume it's a valid historical tool, which is a big assumption given that no historian actually uses this. But we'll bite. Number one, his mother is a royal virgin. Now at first that seems plausible, but then you actually consider how this is used in other myths, and in every other myth, they mean a god had sex with a virgin. And that is clearly not what is going on in the gospel accounts. So to apply this to Jesus is a pathetic case of special pleading. Two, his father is a king. In the other accounts, it always refers to the uh, hero's human father. Not to the god who fathered him, but to the human father who raised him. And in every other case, to, to call Jesus the son of God in this criteria, if you're going to do this, this overlaps with five. But if you're going to be consistent, then the son of God, or something like that, um, clearly doesn't apply to Joseph. Joseph wasn't a king. Um, Mary wasn't a royal virgin. His father and mother are related. Carrier, I believe, tries to apply this. I'm not 100% sure on that. But other atheists do try to apply this to Jesus. And there is no information about whether uh, Joseph or Mary were related. And this scale, this website I'm looking at, does make that clear. For his conception was unusual. Well, we'll give that, because his conception rather was unusual. He was said to be the son of God, that's fine. Uh, attempt was made to kill him when he was a child, that's true. He was spirited away, that's true. He was reared, reared by foster parents in a country far away. Reared means grown up. He was raised, uh, and clearly he wasn't. Matthew 2.15 states that Jesus was raised in Egypt until Herod died. He was still a baby when they returned. Um, or he was at least a few years old. He clearly wasn't raised to manhood. Um, number nine, little or no information is known about his childhood. In the original scale, it's no information is known about his childhood. And we do know stuff about Jesus' childhood according to the gospel accounts of his um, circumcision, as this one says. Not just his baptism, about him being a baby, about where he challenged people, uh, challenged teachers in the temple of Jerusalem. He challenged the Pharisees, and people were shocked at this little kid's wisdom and mary comes back and says son why have you grieved us so and jesus says don't you know i had to be in my father's household so we do know stuff about his childhood 10 he goes to a future kingdom now this website deliberately cuts the rest of the criteria short it might be deliberate maybe i shouldn't make false accusations like that i don't know their intentions but they they cut the criteria short which says he goes to a future kingdom upon reaching manhood and the, and the answer to this is Jesus went to Jerusalem before his last Passover, um, where he was declared king by the public. 
Carrier says Jesus returns to Nazareth. None of these are using the kingdom uh, thing the way the other accounts do. In every other myth, it's always about a hero going to a kingdom where he has political authority. Jesus didn't have political authority in, in Nazareth, uh, nor was he king over just Nazareth. He's king over the world. And he's not a political king in the gospel accounts. He will be. That's the Christian belief. He will eventually establish reign over the whole earth. But at the moment, and especially in the gospel accounts, he wasn't a political king. Now it says uh, where he was declared king by the public, John 12, 13 says, A great multitude took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Now, what this uh, account fails to mention is that Jesus wasn't the type of king people were expecting. People were expecting a Messiah warrior king who threw off the enemies of Israel, and clearly Jesus wasn't that kind of king. Eleven is also interesting because it, um, it cuts the criteria short again. He's victorious over the king. Well, it's not just he's uh, victorious over the king. He's victorious over a king, dragon, or wildebeest. Now, this justification is the passage in John 18, 36 describes how Jesus demonstrated superior debating skill when interviewed by Pilate. Was Pilate a king? Well, the account mentions it. He was not a king. He was a procurator, a type of governor. But he still had enormous power. Well, but that's still a case of special pleading. Because in every other account, if you're going to be consistent, it's about a uh, hero beating a king or a wildebeest or something like that. Carrier tries to say Jesus beat the devil, but clearly this isn't a kind of mythical, physical, hand-to-hand -hand combat battle with a enemy, like in the other myth accounts. So again, this is a case of special pleading. He marries a princess. Well, clearly there's, there's no case of marrying a princess. Kyrie tries to say, he married the church, right? Well, in all of these other accounts, it's not a metaphor. The hero marries a woman, um, and the church is a metaphorical wife. Um, now, that's not to say that 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 diminishes the reality of Jesus' marriage to the church. Rather, to apply this criteria to Jesus' marriage to the church is inappropriate. Um, additionally, the mention of Jesus being married to the church, that in itself isn't mentioned in the gospel accounts. Now, that's implied, but it's not mentioned by the gospel accounts. So, to apply the criteria to Jesus because of the gospel accounts is, is just silly. Thirteen, he becomes king. Again, now the account will say he was proclaimed king of Israel um, in every other account, in every other myth. This is used to denote some sort of king of political authority. So this, again, is a case of special pleading. He reigns uneventfully and for a while. This one says he does not reign in the sense of having temporal power, and that's the point. Every other myth account, that's the case. However, Mark 12, 27 to 13 describes how he holds court in the Jerusalem temple, as though that's supposed to be a meaningful parallel. Um, he does not hold court in the sense that he's a king who gathers in a bunch of people. Rather, um, he is challenging the Jewish elite. Uh, so that's not a meaningful parallel. Again, he prescribes laws. Mark 12 and 13, This the justification here is he issues teachings and parables and prophecies. But taken with legal force by his followers? Well, they're not taken with legal force in the sense of being political. Um, they're taken as authoritative over our lives, authoritative to God. But they're not taken in the sense of Jesus having a political reign, um, in the sense of a decree that goes out from a king and you are to obey this king who reigns over a political land. So, again, this is a case of special pleading. He loses favor with the gods or his subjects. Jesus doesn't really have subjects. We could give this to them on very shaky grounds, but again, this is a case of special pleading. He is driven from the throne or the city. He wasn't driven from the throne. Again, in these other myths, this hero has to run away. He has to flee. But Jesus wasn't driven out of the throne or the city. He submits to his death, um, to his trial. He has a mysterious death. This may or may not apply. This sort of applies. Um, but not really. Crucifixion wasn't really mysterious. Dying after an unexpectedly short time isn't really mysterious because people did die in a few hours during crucifixion, um, depending on the type of crucifixion. And given the account that we have for Jesus, it's really not surprising. How This is the more uh, 
more appropriate part that might actually apply to the criteria. Describes how the sun stopped shining when the curtain temple was torn in two. And describes major earthquakes sufficiently strong to split rocks. That sort of applies. Um, but not doesn't fully satisfy the criteria. Dies at the top of a hill. Okay, that's fine. He has any children. If they do, they do not succeed him. Um, and this one admits there's nothing in the Christian scriptures to indicate that Jesus had children. His body was not buried. Um, now, I need to check the criteria on that, because I believe the criteria is... Okay, there we, that's fine. His body is not buried. Jesus' body was buried, um, so that's not actually a valid use of the criteria. He was raised from the dead, but he wasn't... He was still buried. One or more holy sculptures. Now, the problem is, is that for uh, this criteria, the Church of the Holy Sculpture was built years after the events that happened, actually centuries after. And the more interesting thing about that is it was built because the Christians believed Jesus was a historical person. So the people who are in close proximity to Jesus all believe he was a historical person. As I pointed out in my last videos, the disciples believed Jesus was a historical person. They believed they ate with him and, and saw him crucified and died. And Paul channeling their beliefs reaffirms that, believes Jesus was a human person who was born under the law, sent in the likeness of sinful flesh. Um, in short, Carrier's use of the Raven scale is actually completely fallacious. So let's actually count out how many actually applied to Jesus when the scale is applied consistently. Uh, his father is a king, uh, often a near relative, that's not. So we have four and five, so that makes two. Um, we have three, an attempt is made to kill him, spirited away, four, reared, that doesn't apply, told nothing of his childhood, that doesn't apply either. On reaching manhood, that doesn't apply. Victory over a king or a giant or a dragon or wild beast, that doesn't apply. Marries a princess, that doesn't apply. Becomes king, that doesn't apply in the sense it's used in the other uh, myths. For a time he reigns uneventfully, that doesn't apply because his reign wasn't uneventful and he wasn't even reigning as a political king. Prescribes laws, that doesn't apply because he doesn't. Uh, but he is actually the fulfillment of the law. But later he loses favor with gods and or his subjects. He doesn't have subjects. Um, you could probably stretch this to apply, but if we're, again, being consistent, it doesn't. Driven from the throne and city, he wasn't driven from it. He submitted to his death, after which he meets with a mysterious death. We'll give that to them. Um, often at the top of a hill, we'll give that one to them. His children, if any, do not succeed him. Uh, that's false. Uh... His body is not buried, but nevertheless, he has one or more holy sculptures. So at best, you get about 6 to 8. Um, you do not get 18 or 20. The only way you get those numbers is by a large case of special pleading, like stretching this scale beyond belief. And if you think about that, we can really do that to any figure. Someone actually tried to apply the scale to Harry Potter, and Harry Potter only got 8. So does that mean Harry Potter is a historical person? Uh, the scale in and of itself, the point of me bringing that up, is to use the scale as a historical tool is flawed. As this scale, this one actually has the fact that Harry Potter only meets eight. Odysseus only has, Odysseus meeting eight. So does that mean Odysseus was a real person? Well, of course not. Um, so the scale in and of itself isn't a valid historical tool. Even if it, we apply the scale to Jesus, he doesn't get 20 or 21. The only way you get those numbers is by stretching this. So Carrier's argument as a whole fails completely. Now, again, I will link a blog that has done a review of other points Carrier has made. Um, but there is a good reason why Carrier isn't taken seriously by academic, namely his views are complete rubbish.